The second huge steel door swung open. There was death row. It was a narrow corridor, 33 feet long. Everything was the same color. Cream. My mind quickly counted the tiny cells. It seemed there were five on each side, but closer inspection showed one to be a shower room and the opposite one a bare cubicle with a little table in the middle of it. A visiting room, obviously. One cell was for the guards, known as staff, one man and one woman. They looked at me quizzically as my escort, big, old, bushy Mr. Morell, led me in. This is Susan Atkins, he said, his jolly, watery eyes twinkling as he gave me a big smile. It seemed genuine. Suddenly, two other faces were watching me. Pat was standing, looking out of the first cell on the right. There was Leslie in the second one on the same side. The right together, I thought, dreading the hostility I was certain would arise from their opinion of me as a snitch. I mustered as much courage as I could. Hi, I said, probably too loudly, and grinned broadly. They spoke almost simultaneously. Hello. It was very cool. Each stepped back from the doorway of her cell. The woman's staff led me down the corridor past the two girls, who were sitting on their beds to the fourth and last cell on the right. An empty cell separated me from Leslie and Pat. Is this it? I said aloud. This is it, Pat answered. The last stop. I turned into the cell, nine feet by eleven, and stared at the interior. A metal-framed single bed bolted and cemented to the floor at the far end, an open toilet with no seat, and a small sink in the near corner. I couldn't restrain a chuckle. It looks as bad as I do. I thought to myself. I was a sorry sight, I was sure, standing there in a gray ankle-length strong dress, so named because of its strong resistance to tearing, with a bald head and a still bloody X on my forehead. The woman slammed a door behind me. I turned around. It was made of bars and a grill, with an opening for passing things through. An awesome steel door with an eight-inch square window at head height was ajar. What about that one? I asked the woman. Aren't you going to close that one too? That one stays open all the time except for emergencies. Except when you want to shut it to use the toilet. Ugh. I looked at the open john. Not even a cover. The woman went back to the head of the corridor. And that was Death Row, SCIW, the California Institution for Women. It was a low, sprawling, military-like institution near the city of Ontario, 40 miles east of Los Angeles. I had been impressed by the setting on the way in, a plateau of farmlands with mountains almost everywhere you looked. It was really the boondocks, dominated by Old Baldy, a massive 10,000-foot mountain only a few miles in the distance. Hey, Pat, I said loudly. What do you do all day? The answer was even and emotionless. Nothing. I noticed the strange echo of our voices along the hall of our cold, stark home, the Special Security Unit, SSU. Where did you get your scarves? I asked. Each was wearing a brightly colored scarf that hid her baldness and X. Our parents brought them. I was surprised. I thought the past was supposed to be severed, forgotten. I didn't say my thoughts aloud, asking instead, You're allowed visitors? Only parents and lawyers, no friends. And your mail is censored. 
Pat was the only one answering my questions. My nervousness intensified and began to show in my voice. When do you eat? I asked. Suddenly, Leslie's voice rang sharply along the corridor. Why don't you stop asking so many questions? Just shut up and watch. My stomach sank. The hostility had been laid bare. I sat on the bare mattress and did my best to put away Leslie's remark. There aren't any sheets or blankets, I said mildly. They'll bring them to you. It was Pat's voice again. Before long, the woman guard appeared with two blankets, two sheets, a pillowcase, two towels, and a washcloth. Hey, can I have a cigarette? I asked her. She went to the staff room and returned with a cigarette, handing it to me through the door opening. Can I have a match? The watchwoman lit the cigarette through the door. You can't have the matches, she said, and then stood at the door as I smoked. When you're finished, she went on slowly, don't put it out. Give it to me. She stood at the door until I had finished. An old fury rose in my throat, and I immediately hated all the staff and all authority. I cursed the watchwoman without speaking. My anger, which was all over my face, didn't seem to face her, however. A few minutes passed, and the male and female staff brought lunch to us, sliding it through the, the slot in each door. I stared at the plastic tray. There was one frankfurter, hash brown potatoes, green beans, ice cream, milk, coffee, placed in plastic dishes, and accompanied by plastic knives, forks, and spoons. Not bad, I mumbled softly. The food at Sybil Brand had been terrible. I ate quickly, pushing aside the hot dog. Like most of my colleagues, I had stopped eating meat a year and a half or so earlier. Finishing the meal, I yelled for another cigarette. Just a minute, came an answer. I waited twenty minutes, my rage rising higher and higher, until I was ready to blow it at the woman. But... Morell brought the cigarette. As I smoked, I asked him, When am I going to be let outside? I expected a short retort, but instead, the aging correctional officer, who stood at six foot two or three and must have weighed about 220 pounds, answered warmly, Right now, my friend. I looked up into his face. He had a big wad of chewing tobacco in his one jaw. His eyes still twinkled. He opened the door for me, and I looked out into an enclosed yard, about fifty feet wide and twenty deep. Stepping through the doorway, I took a deep breath of fresh air. I hadn't seen the outdoors up close in nearly two years. I walked into the afternoon sunshine and held my face up to it. I had grown very pale and thin during my early imprisonment spotting a patchy piece of dirt near the right corner of the barbed wire fence i walked slowly to it and sat down i picked up a small handful of the thin dirt and let it run through my fingers over and over after a few seconds i scooped some into my hand and lifted it to my nose i had forgotten what dirt smelled like Completely lost in my moment of return to nature, I sat and played in that little patch of dirt like a child. I don't know how many minutes passed, probably only a few, but I became aware that I was crying. I looked up into the pale blue Southern California sky, and I saw out of the corner of my eye that Morel was watching me tenderly. In a few moments, I noticed other things in the yard. Right behind Morel was a tree, beautiful and green, and there was a second one, too. And there, straight ahead from the door, was a concrete bench. My eyes swept all over the low brick buildings, the strong high fences, the lawns, the sidewalks that made up CIW. It's like a campus, I thought. But it was far away, despite its nearness. 
I got to my feet and walked to one of the trees. I touched it gingerly and then put my arm around it. Nice tree, I said, and hugged it. I turned to the correctional officer. How long can I stay out? An hour for now. You can come out at one at a time for an hour, but always with a guard. At the end of the hour, as I was being escorted back into my cell, I asked if I could stop and talk with Pat and Leslie for a minute. Not right now, Morel answered. His eyes were tender, but his expression was serious. I could tell he was concerned about my relationship with my two co-defendants. I had picked up some whispers along that line as I was being skin searched and showered that morning at the receiving guidance center. Let's see what'll happen now, I had heard one woman say. She's in it for now, I thought another said. Pat and Leslie had been at CIW about a month when I arrived after being sentenced for the Hinman murder and they had plenty of time to plan a strategy for dealing with me, whom they considered to be their personal snitch. Our togetherness front had collapsed after our trial. There had even been talk of their planning to kill me. Back in my cell, I slept until supper, which consisted of beef stew on noodles, creamed corn, two slices of bread, coffee, sugar, milk, and chocolate cake. Again, I skipped the meat. By nightfall, we had a new lone watchwoman for the night. She was kind enough, but distant, keeping a close eye on all of us and making notations in her logbook. She seemed to be interested in anything we said or did that would cast light on our attitudes. It was a strange sensation to know that all your words and actions were being monitored. On death row in California, residents were allowed the luxury of television sets, although in that first stage, the three of us shared one, placed on the wall opposite our cells. I could see most of the screen by sitting to the far right of my door and peering left. It was uncomfortable, but provided one way of passing time in those early days. Later, we would really move into luxury when each of us was provided a set. That night in late spring of 1971, we watched the news, but I have no recollection of what the world was concerned with at that time. I know the Manson family was no longer big news. I interrupted my TV watching long enough to take a shower at the far end of our unit near the staff office. I stood under the hot water and let it roll off my pale, skinny body. Prison pallor had definitely taken it over. So this is it, until I die. By then, I had pretty well settled the matter in my head. I was ready to pay for the crimes I had committed. I was ready to die in the gas chamber, as prescribed, and I didn't care when they took me. My only thoughts about it were whether my knees would buckle at the last minute, and I'd have to be carried in. I also wondered what I'd say at the end. I had no expectation of survival. I was scared and confused, but not about the gas chamber. It centered on my aloneness. I had betrayed humanity. I had betrayed my colleagues. And I had betrayed myself. There was no one left. My alienation was complete. The water beat down on my back. How long will it take? I thought. Will they continue to freeze me out for the rest of time? Will I be able to keep from going crazy? That was a strange thought. Am I already crazy? We watched television until 11.30 when the lights were put out, except for the bare light bulb in each of our cells. Occasionally, in the night, my nervous sleep was broken by the soft, rubber-soled tread of the watchwoman's shoes pacing up and down the concrete-floored corridor. Step, squeak, step, squeak, step, squeak. 
Work on the special security unit of the CIW began during the penalty phase of the Tate LaBianca trial. The workers weren't sure they were preparing a death row or a maximum security suit, although the long strongest hunches were that it was the former. At any rate, a lawn was provided and a gigantic fence erected. It made a good yard for us, 24 times around, equaling one mile. I walked it regularly. There was also ample space for us to plant our flower gardens. Our capabilities in making things pretty, as well as our embroidery talents, which were revealed by Pat and Leslie before I arrived, gave us rather an ambiguous reputation. How could those Manson women, who had done such foul things on the one hand, produce such beauty on the other? Our embroidery became so good that national publications wrote about it. And we became very meticulous about our own appearances and the cleanliness of the entire unit. Pat's dad brought a cut rug for our visiting room, and we had decorations we made ourselves. We eventually got bedspreads for our very unattractive beds, and even were allowed to make and have our own clothes, where, once again, we were ingenuous in drawing color and beauty out of very little. We were really the beastly beauties. Pat, at five foot four and a year older than I, was not a classic beauty, but comely and attractive nonetheless, except for the slumping, round-shouldered manner in which she walked. Her long auburn hair was very thick and provided a good framework for her blue eyes. She was educated, well-read, and articulate, although her speech had a cold, reserved quality to it, especially with those she knew very little. Leslie, on the other hand, had the effervescence, the big, broad smile, the excitability of a collegiate queen. She was tall, five, six and a half, and very thin, and carried herself with exceptional elegance. Her smiling, beaming face and brown eyes were framed by dark brown hair, worn shoulder length with bangs. We soon were allowed to keep one package of cigarettes and a book of matches in our cells, which was quite a breakthrough. The potential for destruction with the matches was rather great, and at the end of our first six months there, we were allowed to keep small cans of foodstuffs and snacks in our cells, but all cans and pool tops had to be returned to the staff. Inside our cells, we were permitted to have cardboard boxes for tables to set things on. It took about three and a half years for us to get additional furniture, a desk, closet, and wooden box to cover the toilet. Despite our refinements indoors and out, SSU was still very much a prison. We were under constant surveillance and the security was tight. There was a hotline telephone, for example, placed between the two heavy doors leading into our wing from the other part of the building. I understood that if the receiver were merely lifted, alarms would be set off in the San Bernardino, Chino, and Ontario pl police departments, bringing armed policemen in helicopters and cars. In minutes, they could have the unit sealed off. A few months after my arrival, the population on death row was increased again first by the arrival of Claire, who had been convicted of killing an elderly woman during a burglary, and a short time later Jennifer, sentenced for killing the wife of her lover. Claire, who had spent three and a half years on a hospital death row, brought a lot of prison savvy with her. In short order, she opened our eyes to additional privileges we were entitled to. She was a short woman with short blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. Agitation gripped her as she paced the floor of her cell, telling us to stand up for our rights. And, of course, as she fought for things for herself, the prison authorities had to include us, too. And even more privileges came with beautiful Jennifer, a tall, very proper and sophisticated woman in her early 20s. 
Time out of our cells, for example, increased gradually from one hour to five hours at certain periods. One of the most significant events in my entire life at CIW came immediately after my arrival. A Roman Catholic chaplain came to see me wearing a brown leather Bible. Susan, he said, handing it to me. This was sent to you by a woman named Horvath. She sent one to each of you girls. I looked at it. Susan Atkins was inscribed on the front. <laughs> I said sharply, a lot of good that'll do me now. I tossed it onto one of the boxes in the corner and gave the chaplain a big smile. Thanks, anyhow. After he left, I went to the box and picked up the Bible, opening to the front flyleaf. Sure enough, something was written there. Jesus, my prayer is that you reveal yourself to Susan Atkins. Who in the hell is Shirley Horvath? I muttered angrily, flipping the book back to the box. I threw myself onto the bed and grabbed my embroidery. I jumped back up and threw down the embroidery. I'm going crazy. I yelled inside myself. These games we're playing are driving me out of my mind. Here I was, waiting to die, and we were playing all kinds of games about our privileges, and about embroidery and sewing, and about gardens and flowers, and now a Bible from some weird little old lady. These people can all go to hell. My mind was still a mess, but over the weeks and months, I was coming to see that I was being eaten up by my guilt and my loneliness. Even my body was deteriorating badly. I had had gonorrhea so many times that the prison medical authorities wanted me to have a hysterectomy. But I refused, and my teeth were getting uglier and uglier and painful too. I had taken so many drugs that my entire mouth was rotting away. I had to have tons of dental work. But my guilt, what was that about? Was I sorry for what I had done to innocent people? No. I was sorry mainly for the betrayal of the people I thought I had loved. And I was being forced to live with two of them in a space the size of someone's living room. My twisted dreams at night never ended. I was alone. I was hated. And I hated in return. My letters to my remaining family were full of that hate full of attempts to inflict pain. I was determined in my mind and madness to infect everything and everyone with pain and madness. Had that Los Angeles reporter been right? Someone had told me what he wrote, probably, Leslie or Pat. Was he right? Watching her behavior, bold and actressy in court, cute and mincing when making eye play with someone. I get the feeling that one day she might start screaming and simply never stop. <laughs>